These are images from an MRI scan of a 25-year-old woman with relapsing MS. You can see the abundant periventricular T2 lesions, numerous gadolinium-enhancing lesions, and on sagittal images, T1 dark holes. But what are these lesions? What's inside of them? Today, we'll take a look at the histopathology of multiple sclerosis. We'll look at biopsy and autopsy studies and see what type of white blood cells are within the lesions and what are the implications for treatment and future treatments. I give credit to Dr. Claudia Lucanetti, who's the source of many of the images I'm about to show you, pictured here from this publication and several others, references in the notes below. My name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday. To look at the big picture, multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disease, meaning the primary injury is to the myelin, the fatty covering of the nerve fibers. What you're looking at is a pathological section with staining for the myelin protein, PLP, or proteolipid protein. This is an immunohistochemistry stain. What this means is there's an antibody that binds PLP and also has a fluorescent component, and so it lights up. And so the brown component on the right is where we have myelin, where we have proteolipid protein, and the white area on the left is the demyelinated area. But you can see there are a lot of components that are still alive, which are the axons and other extracellular components. You can also see a blood vessel vessel as demyelination tends to occur around the post-capillary venules. I'm going to refer to different types of white blood cells within the lesions, so I'll give you a brief primer of the immune system. All white blood cells come from the hematopoietic stem cells within the bone marrow. On the left of the slide, you can see the innate immune system, the part of the immune system that you're born with, along with erythrocytes, or red blood cells, and thrombocytes, or platelets. Now, these cells do not learn or change throughout your lifetime. However, they are important in the inflammation of MS, and we can see macrophages and specialized resident macrophages of the central nervous system, microglia, not shown here within the lesions. However, there's strong evidence that it's primarily the adaptive immune system on the right side of the slide that's primarily important in initiating the inflammation of MS, the B and T lymphocytes. When I was a medical student, I was taught that MS is a T cell disease because this is the lymphocyte which is most present within the MS lesions. However, the B lymphocytes are also important. These are the cells that make antibodies and various modern multiple sclerosis drugs, rituximab, ocrevus, casimta, and briumvi work on these cells. There are also plasma cells which also make antibodies. The B cells and plasma cells can produce antibodies as depicted here. These normally are proteins which target viruses, bacteria, and fungi, but they can also target myelin targets in multiple sclerosis such as myelin basic protein. There's a conserved component and also a variable component or antigen binding fragment which targets antigen or proteins or pieces of proteins. Bound antibodies can recruit other cells to cause injury. They can also initiate a complement cascade. This is a cascade of proteins in the blood normally involved in attacking encapsulated bacteria such as Neisseria meningitidis, a common cause of meningitis, but they can also cause injury in MS. So I'll show you some pathological slides and then we'll bring it all together at the end. This is an immunohistochemistry looking at T cells and you can see many T cells, the brown stain surrounding a blood vessel marked with the arrow, difficult to see on this particular slide, a perivascular infiltrate of white blood cells typical of MS. This is a stain for complement that's activated, and you can see it everywhere throughout the lesion. Sometimes it has a linear configuration denoted by the dark arrows, indicated that it's binding axons or nerve fibers. This slide shows abundant macro macrophages within the lesions. Those are the cells you see here, but the stain is actually for myelin, the brown pigment, and these macrophages are actually phagocytizing or eating the myelin, which is why you see it within the cells. So all of those slides were in the white matter, the subcortical area of the brain, and that's where we think of multiple sclerosis lesions being 
present because we could see them easily on the MRI, but similar pathology is also seen in the cortex, the surface of the brain where the neurons are present. This is a slide of the subpeal cortex. This is the very surface of the brain at the top of the slide, and we're looking at a PLP proteolipid protein stain, so it's just showing where the myelin is present. So the brown stain is actually the normal tissue, and this huge white area is a demyelinated plaque immediately under the surface of the brain. The arrows are showing the edge between normal and abnormal tissue. Characteristic of multiple sclerosis, there's a very sharp edge between normal and abnormal. Just like in the white matter in the cortex, we see extensive macrophages consuming, eating, phagocytizing the myelin. Again, the stain here is for myelin. You can see it within the cells. This is a CD3 immunohistochemistry stain. CD3 is a marker of T lymphocytes. And just like in the white matter, we can see these extensive infiltrates of T cells around the blood vessels, a perivascular configuration. Again, MS is a perivenular disease. This is a CD68 stain, a marker of macrophages, and also the resident macrophages of the central nervous system, the microglia. And you can see very extensive cells, quite superficially, not just within the cortex, but also within the meninges, the coverings of the brain. And there are also T cells in the meninges. This is specifically a CD8 immunohistochemistry stain, a stain for cytotoxic T cells. And you can see they're abundant in the meninges of active lesions of MS. And I believe helper or CD4 positive T cells are also present. But we're talking about active lesions, right? This is active inflammation. We're not gonna see these types of white blood cells in older people with progressive MS with long-standing stable scars, no change on the MRI, no relapses for many years. Oh, really? This is a slide from a 56-year-old man with MS for 31 years, an old, stable, chronic plaque. Yet with this CD68 stain, there are abundant macrophages and microglia. Now, we think this may contribute to a slow, insidious, smoldering inflammation causing ongoing damage, even in stable chronic plaques that could be driving progressive MS. Now, I mentioned earlier that in MS, there's often sharp demarcation between normal and abnormal. But is that normal appearing white matter really normal? This is a slide of so-called normal appearing white matter, no demyelination. But here they stand for HLA-DR. This is a marker of the major histocompatibility complex type 2. And this shows activated microglia, supposedly with quiescent microglial resident cells. You don't get that much of this stain. And so it seems there's a low level of inflammation even throughout the brain, even in tissue that looks normal and is not demyelinated. It's unclear how this contributes to the pathogenesis of MS. So to put it all together, Dr. Lucanetti described four patterns of multiple sclerosis lesions. And it turns out there's a tendency for an individual person's brain to have one type of pattern, for the lesions to look similar to the other lesions within the same brain. I don't think this is always the case, but there's a general tendency for this to be true. So pattern one lesions, which is about 15% of lesions, don't have a lot of antibodies or complement, but they have abundant cells. So this is a cell cellular picture, a lot of T lymphocytes, macrophages, and microglia, different types of cells. They also note elevation of certain types of cytokines, such as TNF-alpha. I note that drugs that block TNF-alpha, such as humiral and embryo, do not work for multiple sclerosis. They actually worsen multiple sclerosis. And they also find some oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species within the extracellular milieu. Now, the most common is pattern two lesions, 58%, where we see all types of inflammation abundant antibodies targeting various antigens such as anti-MOG or myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, but MS is a polyantigenic disease, not just targeting one component of the myelin, and also complement those proteins that work with antibodies and various types of cells, phagocytes like microglia and macrophages, and lymphocytes, the B and T cells. So that's the most common mixed inflammatory picture. 
Pattern 3 lesions, 26% of lesions, they don't have antibodies or complement, just like pattern 1, but they have a lot of cells, all types of cells, both lymphocytes and macrophages. However, they have one additional prominent feature, which is death of the oligodendrocytes. These are the cells that make myelin within the central nervous system. They're dying at a significant rate. Also, the pathologists describe that these lesions tend to be different from the typical MS lesions in their less well-defined, less well-demarcated. They don't have as much of a sharp edge between normal and abnormal. Now, pattern four lesions are by far the least common, only 1%. Now, keep in mind that diagnosis of multiple sclerosis isn't 100% accurate, so we can be confused here. Also, there may be some biases in who ends up in this study. These are from biopsies and autopsies. Most people with multiple sclerosis don't need a brain biopsy, so we may be biopsying a lesion that looks different. Maybe it's large. It looks like it could be a tumor. It confuses uses the doctors, and of course only certain types of people volunteer to donate their brain to science after they die. But anyway, these pattern 4 lesions really don't have any sign of inflammation whatsoever. No antibodies, no complement, and no cells, but there is profound death of the oligodendrocytes within the white matter. And the form of death is a little bit different than in pattern three. So in pattern three, you see what is known as apoptotic or programmed cell death, and there's a sequence of events within the cells that leads to them dying. But this is non-apoptotic death of oligodendrocytes. I'm not sure what to make of pattern four. It's been associated with a primary progressive phenotype of multiple sclerosis. Of course, it could be an entirely different disease mimicking multiple sclerosis. Another variant of multiple sclerosis pathology is Baylow's concentric sclerosis. This is a myelin stain of someone with Baylow's concentric sclerosis, and you see this onion skinning appearance. You can see myelin on the outside, a lot of demyelination, but these rings of spared tissue creating the appearance of an onion, and this can be seen on MRI scans as well. There's actually good evidence that this is multiple sclerosis. People with it tend to have oligoclonal bands unique to the cerebrospinal fluid, just like in MS. It's been associated with pattern three pathology, again, with a lot of oligodendrocyte death. This pattern of pathology has been described as being similar to certain viral illnesses, though it's not clear that this is a different disease. And some people actually have MRI scans that show a single dominant lesion that has this un skinning appearance, but some people have lesions on MRI that are very typical of MS with maybe one larger lesion that has a partial Baylos-like appearance. My personal opinion is it is a form of multiple sclerosis. Now going back to the cortical lesions, research from Dr. Bruce Trapp describes three types of cortical lesions. Type one are lesions that bridge the gray and white matter. So the very surface of the brain, ironically depicted in white in this diagram is the gray matter, and then here depicted in gray, unfortunately, is the underlying white matter. Type one are leukocortical lesions that bridge the white and gray matter. And we may be able to see these as juxtacortical lesions on conventional MRI. Type two and type three lesions are very difficult to see, if at all, they may be present in seven Tesla MRI. Type two are very small intracortical lesions, and type three lesions are extensive lesions that are right under the pia, the very surface of the brain, and they can go around gyri and be very extensive. This is a large pathological section of a large piece of brain tissue stained with myelin stain, proteolipid protein. So you can see most of the brain is normally myelinated, but they color-coded the demyelinated areas. So in the subcortical white matter, they colored it light blue, and in the cortical demyelinated areas, they colored it light red. And you can see, even though we perceived most of the lesions in MS to be subcortical white matter lesions, 
this particular individual has a lot of extensive type 3 cortical lesions. And we think this contributes very significantly to the symptoms of MS, such as fatigue and cognitive dysfunction, even though they're difficult to see on MRI. Now this may look like a scary slide. You can see a lot of injury to the nervous system here, a lot of atrophy of the brain. However, one optimistic finding from Dr. Bruce Trapp's research is even in older people with advanced progressive MS and a lot of disability, there are actually often oligodendrocytes, the cells of the central nervous system that make myelin within the lesions. They just don't always remyelinate. So people talk about stem cells, but we have something even better than stem cells within the lesions, your own oligodendrocytes, but somehow they fail to remyelinate, and that may be part of the pathogenesis of progressive MS. So what can we do with this information? What are the implications? Well, one thing you probably noticed is a lot of the cells I showed you on those slides are not lymphocytes, even though there's very strong, unequivocal, in my opinion, evidence that it's the lymphocytes that are starting the inflammation in MS. It may be the microglia and macrophages that are continuing it, particularly in long-standing progressive NMS. We need new drugs, perhaps, that target those cells. The Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, like tolibrutinib, could be promising. We'll see what these phase three trials show, and maybe we'll have other drugs that target them in unique ways and control the disease without causing too many side effects. Another thing is a lot of this disease seems to be very superficial in the meninges, in the very superficial subcortical gray matter. Is it possible to deliver a drug not through the IV, not by a pill, but directly to the cerebrospinal fluid? Now this has been attempted. There have been trials on intrathecal rituximab, giving the drug rituximab, a B cell depleter, directly into the cerebral spinal fluid, but it's hard to get good penetration. There's a device called an Omaya reservoir, usually used to treat central nervous system lymphoma and other cancers of the central nervous system, central nervous system metastases to the meninges. Maybe that could be repurposed for certain multiple sclerosis therapies. Of course, it would have to be proven in animal studies and in humans before it was widely used because it's a surgical device implanted. Just an idea that I have. Another thing I didn't talk too much about is oxidative injury. The cells may be coming in, but there's a secondary oxidative injury, a stress on the metabolism of the neurons and the cells. Is there something we could do that's relatively safe, like a butylast or something that has metabolic metabolic or neuron cell protective effects that could be beneficial in progressive MS. The last would be remyelination. Again, the oligodendrocytes are there. Can we turn their programming on so they remyelinate? It makes sense that humans don't necessarily have an adaption to remyelinate. After all, there's not that much injury to the myelin in the general population, so our ancestors wouldn't have necessarily evolved some mechanism to repair myelin, but is there some way to turn the signaling of those cells on? Of course, there's some preliminary research on clomastine. The word is still out on that one, but maybe we need something specific that targets the programming of those cells. So I'd be interested to know, does this change your perspective of multiple sclerosis? Some of these studies are somewhat dated. There are all kinds of newer immunohistochemistry techniques. There's also the possibility of immunophenotyping cells. In modern studies, perhaps we could say, what are these lymphocytes actually targeting? What are the antigens and other aspects of the immune cells? And I'd be also interested to know, would you be willing to donate your brain to science after you pass away, hopefully at an older age for another reason unrelated to MS, so we could learn more about the disease? Supposedly, Dr. Bruce Trapp had people agree to donate their brain, and then if they died, often randomly or much later for another reason, Reason, someone would get paid sometimes in the middle of the night and they would go and do very specific things to try to preserve the brain as best as possible so they could get the 
best images without any contamination. And it was really a big deal if they could get a preserved brain from someone who recently died who happened to have multiple sclerosis. Of course, that's how we learn things, and I really do think there is a practical implication. Of course, I give a ton of credit for the people who did, in fact, donate their brain to science. And let me know if you have suggestions for future videos.